Ignoring women in financial planning is the mistake that many advisors have been making. 126 million women control 51% of the personal wealth in America and 80% of the consumer spending. If women control half of the wealth in the country, then why are advisors ignoring this $800 billion market? 40% of the women are the primary earners in the house with two incomes. And most importantly, they are 100% responsible for the household if they're single which has some great advantages. There isn't anyone to tell them what to do with their money, but 35% of the single women keep half or more of their money in savings rather than investing because the industry simply isn't reaching out to them. Financial services sector is often focused on the men, even when the women are the primary earners. Are women or men going to make it to retirement more successfully? I've seen firsthand over my 15 years how women and especially single women can be neglected in our current marketplace. We have made it our mission to give women the attention they deserve. My team and I have developed a financial wellness formula with women's needs and concerns at the forefront. We start by listening to the personal goals from college planning for kids to caring for an aging parent to juggling a career and a personal life. Next, we need to know what the financial concerns are, which keep you up at night. Then identify the gaps that exist and discuss a process to help accomplish financial goals discovered through our conversation. Throughout this video, we're going to discuss all aspects of being single and managing finance, long-term planning, and Social Security. We believe there needs to be a better focus on educating, building relationships, and offering solutions to the severely underserved market. Financial services is one of the many areas where women are underrepresented, not only as clients. Only 16% of advisors are actually women. Additionally, the Kandar report suggests that women don't seek financial advice because the industry spends 13 times more money advertising to men. Right out of the gate, they're disproportionately favoring men in the marketplace. What money they do spend advertising to women doesn't take the female perspective into account. I'm constantly bombarded with advertising for financial services. But when was the last time you saw a commercial that felt like it was about you or addressed women's financial concerns? Is anyone prioritizing you? Barbara Glasser, an independent financial consultant said in the Kantar Report article, Winning Over Women, was written in 2017. Basically, it all comes down to someone on the other side of the table actually sitting on the same side of the table. Women just want authenticity, someone to understand them and someone to listen to them and hear them, as opposed to coming to the conversation with predetermined beliefs and judgments. I know what you're thinking. I don't fit this demographic, but over time, my practice has evolved in a way that has allowed me to work with women who face these challenges. And it's become a passion of mine to make sure that you get the attention you deserve from someone who understands your perspective. One of the ways the industry is failing women is in retirement. During open enrollment, one female investor said, you check the box and then you forget about it. You know the box, we've all seen it. It's the box you check or don't check, to sign up for retirement plan or as well as the investments. A decision that takes seconds to make determines what you'll be investing towards retirement for the next 12 months or 20 years. Only 45% of women will have enough money in their accounts to retire comfortably. The stats get much bleaker when you factor in divorce or ultimately the death of the spouse. As a financial planner, when I hear that someone made their investment selection by just checking boxes, my first thought is, is how do you know if you're on track? How do you know if those are the right boxes to check or the right boxes for your situation? I agree that doing something's better than nothing, but a little advice could go a long way. I worked with a client who made an investment selection that seemed like the best one at the time. But after review of the selection, it turned out to be way riskier than she would have wanted. That's not a tough problem to fix, but you have to identify it first and it could have lasting repercussions on her financial future. On the other hand, what if there isn't even a box to check? What if you stayed home to raise a family? What if you devoted your time to volunteering? 
or working for nonprofits? What if you worked part-time and weren't offered the retirement plan that your work offers? Maybe you were newly single and are checking the box for the first time or just received the lump sum and need help moving forward towards retirement. Even women who work consistently over the course of their lives have less retirement savings than their male counterparts. A T. Rowe Price survey found the median 401k balance for baby boomer women is $59,000, less than half of what it is for baby boomer men at $138,000. Think about this, a woman working for the same number of years as a man is still likely going to have less saved for retirement. Simply put, we have more work to do. Factor in the studies show women tend to live longer than men, meaning they clearly need more money saved in retirement. The good news is it's never too late to start saving for retirement, and our financial wellness formula can help point you in the right direction. One of the things we'll talk about is Social Security. One of the fears we hear most often from our clients is that Social Security will no longer exist by the time they're ready to collect. Believe it or not, this isn't a new concern. In 1981, Congress was sure that Social Security would run out the following year. And in 1981, they made changes to ensure it would stick around. The Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1981 made major changes in Social Security to help make sure that it remains solvent. We can never be certain what the future holds, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't explore all available options and resources, or that we shouldn't try to understand all the benefits we might be eligible for. We recently worked with a client who contributed to Social Security for years. Now she's going to make a decision whether now is the best time to take it. Her and I have worked together for over a decade, so I knew about her prior marriage almost 20 years ago. She'd been married for 12 years, more than the 10 year requirement, and that made her eligible for spousal Social Security, which she can still collect even if he remarried. A lot of people don't realize this. This is just one of the many small pieces that are going to come together to help create the best picture for your financial future. Financial planning is going to take not just your current situation into account, but all aspects of your finances to ensure you're getting the most holistic guidance we can offer. Part of the purpose of this video is to introduce you to myself, my team, and my practice. But I also want you to walk away with new knowledge about how financial planning can impact your life today, tomorrow, and in the future. Say we have a client who is keeping almost 80% of her money in cash savings account earning 0.75%. She currently has saved about $250,000 in total assets. This means she's keeping about $200,000 liquid her money's purpose is for the future. This means that it's in an account now where it probably could be doing more for her. This is a great place to discuss the topic of her current financial position. Many factors go into cash you have on hand. There are many extenuating circumstances that, which could lead to keep most of your money in cash, but without any of those in her situation, it isn't necessary. We've often have the discussion with our clients on an amount of their emergency fund that we'll recommend. This amount is determined by looking at your monthly expenses. Then we look at what could happen and why you might need this money. Maybe you lose a job, sickness, or unable to work. Maybe a family member which may need you home from work. These items lead us to look at the recommended amount to keep in cash on a regular basis. This can vary, but we will usually advise a minimum of three months of expenses in your savings. Monthly expenses should include all those fixed expenses, such as debt, phone, housing expenses, food, internet, kids items, items for your pet, and all insurance premiums. This is part of the process to listen to you and learn about these circumstances. Then together, we will determine what amount is best to keep saved. Now we've determined the amount of emergency savings. 
We also need to determine the risk we're willing to take. Risk tolerance questions allow us to advise on where your extra cash can go, along with determining when you might use it in the future. For this example, we'll use a four to six year timeline, as well as moderate risk tolerance. During this time frame, our recommendation may be to take a moderate conservative approach to investing, which has a goal to achieve three to 5% return on your money. Currently, our example client has $250,000 in total assets. She has $50,000 in her retirement account through work and is holding $200,000 in cash. After reviewing her monthly expenses, we've determined three months of funds held in case of an emergency should equal about $20,000. That being said, the question becomes, what should she do with $180,000 left over? Let's say she leaves it in a savings account, gaining roughly three quarters of a percent per year. After five years, the money would have grown to $186,852. However, what if we invest instead? If we take those dollars and moderately conservative account for the same five years, she has the potential to increase the amount of money she has. For example, if we assume the moderately conservative rate would just be 3% per year, at the end of the fifth year, she'd have $208,669. By choosing the second option, she could potentially have $21,817 more dollars than if she just held it in cash. Again, this scenario is not uncommon. Like I mentioned, 35% of women are keeping half their money in cash. So we've established that there is a value of working with a financial planner, but let's discuss expectations of how this all starts. First off, we'll be face to face. A big part of the planning is building a rapport and a relationship. We wanna to get to know you and give you an opportunity to get to know us. As the conversation progresses, and if you become more comfortable answering questions about your current position, how you arrive there, which will be important, we need to understand your individual needs, goals, objectives, so that we can have a constructive dialogue about how you achieve them. Financial planning takes into account investments, estate planning, income, expenses, retirement, college planning, taxes, and so much more. You're not just going to get a canned set of recommendations. We'll be providing custom financial advice tailored to you to cover you now and well in the future. Taxes aren't what most people think of or think about when they're coming to a financial planner, but it's one of the most important planning tools we have. To be clear, I'm not an accountant or a CPA, nor do I do taxes but knowing what type of accounts and how taxes can affect them is part of the overall financial picture. Tax efficient choices can also impact sending your kids to school and having more money now and along the way. If we don't have the answer, we can be your go-to resource for finding the right CPA, accountant, or estate planner. As part of your financial plan and our financial wellness formula, will offer you advice and access to all the necessary professionals you may need. Estate planning is another undervalued part of the financial planning process. For instance, one thing people don't realize is that beneficiary forms trump last will and testaments in court. In 2009, the Supreme Court heard a deceased person's daughter argue that she, not their long divorce ex, should get the retirement plan funds named on the beneficiary forms. Though the ex had waived her claim to the funds during the divorce, the court ruled unanimously that because the beneficiary form was never changed to remove her as sole beneficiary, she still got all the money. One of the many advantages of working long-term with a financial planner is that they are aware of major events as they happen in your life, meaning they can make sure that you're informed as to all the necessary updates to help ensure you and your child's futures. As mentioned before, there are many changes that occur at the crossroads of becoming single again. From small things like beneficiary forms to big things like dealing with a lump sum of money from your ex, 
Sometimes these are held in accounts, 401k accounts still being held at your ex-husband's company. Forbes published an article talking about the nasty surprises that women can expect during divorce. Things like marital debt, the staggering cost of health insurance, and even the simple uh, unexpected high cost of the divorce itself. It's not uncommon to be surprised by some of the changes brought about by divorce. In fact, 38% of women over 55 said that they experienced financial surprises during the divorce. I can't imagine what it's like going through a divorce, being newly single. I also can't imagine what it must be like to lose a spouse. A survey conducted by Merrill Lynch showed that 69% of widows said becoming the sole financial decision maker was one of the top financial challenges they faced and only 14% of them were making decisions before their spouse passed. Women are three times more likely to lose a spouse. So we encounter this circumstance frequently in our practice, unfortunately. Which brings me back to the plain and simple fact that I'm not part of the demographic, but I've had the privilege of developing many relationships in this area over the years. Throughout the years of my practice, it's become apparent the single female demographic is where the industry is lacking and where I can make the most difference. Not by design, but naturally my practice has continued to service more and more women from the single demographic. My life is full of strong women as well, from my client base to my family. My son Grayson and I are outnumbered in a house with my two daughters, Madison and Peyton, and my lovely wife, Beth. Beth actually works on my female dominated team which keeps me grounded when it comes to working with women's issues. Let me introduce you to some of them. My name is Beth Puckett. I work with Ryan as his executive assistant at Skylight Financial Group. I come to the team with a business management degree from The Ohio State University and a background in property management. My role with Ryan and the team is to service new and existing clients, being your first contact and continued support liaison, scheduling meetings, reviews, or conference calls. I manage Ryan's calendar and workload to allow for a work-life balance plan for himself and our family. Hi, my name is Ronnie Grebner. I'm a financial planner as well, and I work with Ryan mainly on the financial plan strategy. You'll most likely see me in plan meetings as well as review meetings. I was drawn to this career because I really wanted to be able to see the impact my work has from start to finish on the lives of the people we help. I honestly believe we are fulfilling an often ignored need in our community, and I love that I have the opportunity to serve others. I'm Hannah, and I'm Ryan's admin assistant. I help Ryan input the data into financial plans, as well as with a lot of technical back office tasks like account opening and maintenance, service requests, and data gathering. You'll interact with me uh, when we need additional information, paperwork, or additional details about previously collected information. I was drawn to the business because it seemed like a great opportunity to do one of the things that I love which is to take complex problems and find simple solutions that make our clients' lives a little bit easier. We've already talked about the fact that we'll be meeting face-to-face. -face. The initial sit-down, besides being an opportunity to get to know one another, is also an opportunity to discover where your concerns lie. We actually call this the discovery meeting for just that reason. During this meeting, you'll find that you get to do most of the talking, whether you have an immediate pressing concern or whether you would like us to just take a more comprehensive approach to your finances. The goal here is to figure out what brought you to the office in the first place. It might turn out that we aren't a good fit for one another, and in that instance, we'll shake hands and part as friends. We know you're busy and that your time is valuable, so there's no pressure if it won't be a mutually beneficial relationship. If we decide to move forward, then our next step would be to gather more detailed information and to then reconvene and discuss. We call this the data gathering meeting. And the purpose is to make sure my team has all the pieces they need to create a comprehensive picture. Then my work begins and it's time to strategize. My team and I will take some time to do what we have to do and then invite you in and ensure that the plan is accurate and that we're on the same page. We'll present different concepts which are applicable to your unique objectives once we've got all the data and we're on the same page and you've given us 
your feedback. All that's left to do is for us to deliver your finalized plan. From there, we'll set up your regular check-ins, either annually or semi-annually, by your choice, so that we can continue to have a dialogue about your financial situation, implement aspects of your financial plan, and keep your plan updated as circumstances in your life change. So in closing, we've covered a lot of ground. We've discussed the financial services industry's lack of prioritization when it comes to women. We've talked about what it really looks like to meet with an advisor. We've talked about how much responsibility you have as the CFO of your financial household. We've looked at how financial planning is a holistic process that can not only improve the outlook of retirement, but also help you with current financial situations, like managing assets, sending kids to school, helping with grandkids, or working through any other decisions you may be making. If anything I've said today resonates with you, click the link below. You'll be asked to schedule a meeting and answer a few short questions.